We're calling this class the Art of Effective Praying Workshop. And so it, of course, it's something that is translatable into your own lives, but it's also translatable out here because we are, of course, we've already done it for a couple of weeks, but we're also putting an emphasis on the, on the fact that, that uh, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And so we're going to emphasize that fact as a regular part of the beginning section of all of our worship services now, because, you know, to neglect that is, uh, we're not neglecting a religious ritual, we're neglecting the main PowerPoint connection with God. And it, and uh, so let's commit this to the Lord in prayer that this becomes revelation to you. Father, we thank you right now that we can come and we can better learn how to be more effective as we walk with you and as we walk with your desire and your design in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 5.17 is the particular scripture that I'm going to launch off of on this series. And this particular series of the art of praying more effectively is going to have a lot of installments because uh, there's just so many different kinds of things where we're relearning and we're unlearning and all of that. Because religion has taught us even even good conservative, good evangelical teaching and books uh, have taught us some really good things, although it's been way, way, way incomplete to what it can be. And so that's why we want to just keep developing those areas. And Romans 5.17 says, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, which is the first Adam, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness that that includes you all right yeah. reign in life that means that you happen to life life doesn't happen to you of course it's not on your own because Jesus said in John 15 that without me you can't do anything but we have so many religious understandings of what it means to do things with Jesus. We actually haven't unpacked that very far in our lives. We just have a basic belief. We've been taught for so many years that salvation has to do with getting your ticket punched so you don't have to go to hell and get forgiven of sin. But this part about reigning in life through the one Christ Jesus, what that previously in a lot of teaching is as soon as we get to heaven after the last heartbeat, that's when we're in control or that's when abundant life begins. It's not what the Bible teaches. And so it says, uh, through the gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. He's the one that supplies the power of that. The key thought that I want to, first key thought that I want to emphasize in this class is prayer is creative partnership with God and his sons and daughters. Prayer, what we call prayer, the realm of prayer, the channel of prayer, what we call that is, I want us to think of it now more and more as creative partnership with God. Now I say God, I mean Elohim. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, you know, religion has given us a lot of arguments that we debate over. Oh, well, are you? Do you talk to God, the Father? Because you, it says, pray to the Father, or do you talk to Jesus, or do you talk to the Holy Spirit, or who does what? And it gets it all confused, and then then we don't do any of it, really, very consistently, because we get confused over the kind of thing that I'm talking about in the lessons right now in the, in the church services, all of the misunderstandings of what God never said, but that religion has dictated as the right way to approach him. So um, <laughs> prayer is creative partnership. It's like the creative process is not done. I want you to think in terms of the creation of the world. 
the creation or the creative process is not done. It's just like Acts 28. And see, when God created as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when he created the, the earth, the world, the universe, he did it on the backdrop of great chaos. But he was the father. And of course, a father is supposed to be, if they're a good father, they are going to be mentors. They, their whole lives are supposed to be training their sons and daughters how to live and how to do things. And so the sons watch, uh, uh, you know, you watch the father, particularly. And you go, okay, that's how you do that. So a big part of the Christian life is being a partner with the creative process. And creation hasn't ended. The creation of the first, the substance, the seed of the world is done, but creation itself is not over because there's constantly things to be created and to introduce, things to change, chaos to be tamed, lots of things. And that's not God's job. That's our job. Uh, because he gave us the earth. He set it in order. Then with him, we rule and reign. We don't, we don't put it off on him and saying, okay, God, please do this, and God, please do that, and God, please do something else, you know, because I need you to do this and that. And this situation looks impossible, so you're going to have to do it. He said, it is impossible, but not to you if you'll cooperate with me. Okay. So, and I mentioned the book of Acts. That's... The backs of the Holy Spirit is primarily what the book of Acts is. It's just all of the stories that are involving that. And you've probably heard this before, but Acts 28 doesn't end like any normal story. It's because it's not over. It just keeps on going. Acts 28, at the end of Acts 28, is just, it's a period and then another sentence begins. And then another sentence begins. And we have the privilege, as his sons and daughters, of being part of that sentence. But one of the biggest areas that we become a part of that process is through the realm that we call prayer. But prayer needs to be religiousized, uh, de-religiousized, demystified. Okay. Another principle. Train yourselves to listen to the voice of God <coughs> rather than the speculations of man or apparently what natural circumstances are telling you. Train yourselves, and you have to train yourself. That's why I said this is all a process of learning, relearning, and unlearning. It is because we have to retrain ourselves to think about a lot of things. And how are we going to respond in prayer? Well, effective prayer isn't a matter of begging God to do things. And effective prayer is also not a matter of going out on the battlefield and battling the devil. It's a very interesting story of the widow that kept going to the unjust judge asking for his help. And he wouldn't listen and he wouldn't listen and he wouldn't listen. Now, the, the parable is very clear that it's the extreme in the negative the unjust judge, it just says right there, and God is not at all like the unjust judge. But even the unjust judge answered as soon as he got worn out. Well, it says then, but how much more quickly then will your father automatically answer you? But what did that widow do? She didn't, and she didn't go out and battle the devil, did she? And she didn't go out on the battlefield, did she? She went to the judge. And so we, we wear ourselves, once we recognize that the devil has all of his shenanigans and that there's stuff he, that gets thrown in our paths, and basically the devil's part is trying to get us to think a certain way, then what we do is we get out there and we start binding and loosing and commanding. But you know that the, the scripture on binding and loosing doesn't start on earth? The verbiage starts in heaven. It's, it basically says, what you discover has already been bound by heaven, then make that so in the earth. And whatever has been already loosed by heaven, then you just agree with that into the earth. 
because it takes us agreeing to bring it into the earth. It doesn't take God doing it. It takes us agreeing, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. And so um, now just, just a couple of days ago, I got a, we got a call from Denise and Bill had gone to the ER uh, and um, he hadn't been able, he wasn't able to breathe. And there was a certain amount of fluid on his lungs. And uh, bottom line of it is, uh, the, the surgeon said this, is, this kind of thing is actually common with this kind of an operation. But, uh, you know, he wasn't able to breathe well and there was pressure on his lungs and there was a lot of anxiety, and, which he said himself. I'm afraid I'll go to sleep and I won't wake up and things like that. And that, that will always emphasize the negative to you. And he's doing good now. So at any rate, uh, he went back home that same night. They gave him, you know, they gave him some, um, the stuff to calm his nerves. And they did some tests to find out everything's good. Everything is good. He went home the same night. With, yeah, they went home this. Yeah, he went home the same night. As a matter of fact, he got out of the hospital within, I think, three days of the surgery. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, the, a cool part of the testimony is, uh, that Denise was telling Karen yesterday is people were come, constantly coming into the room going, oh, you're the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? Oh, they didn't know which one. No, they were going, are you the one? And are the, you the one what? You're the one that's doing so good after that bypass surgery because it's got a reputation already. All right, so things come up, okay? The point that I'm talking about this right now is not so much to make an announcement about Bill and us all wonder, well, how's he doing specifically, but to say, okay, this is how we prayed. I ended up going up to see him and we sat and talked and laughed and different things for a while. But as soon as I hung up from Denise, Karen and I prayed, and immediately, because we told you last week that we, Bill got two specific words, prophetic words. One came from me, and another one came from somebody else that I know, but it's got a prophetic anointing, that gave him exactly word for word the same word. And that was that he would rise up stronger than he's ever been. All right, so what did we do? When we prayed for him... We didn't go, oh God, oh God, oh God, you get to do something. The devil's trying to mess this up. And boy, we bind the devil and we stand against the work of the devil. No, we didn't. We said, Lord, we agree with the word over his life. And this is going to be the way it's going to be, period. And that was about the extent of the prayer. Then we prayed for peace, things like that. So what you, when you do have a word for something then the prayers we use are agreements with the word we have. Now, you know, there's been teaching that says that you go out and you find, you know, you take uh, the scripture verses and you, you create and decree those scripture verses. And that's good teaching, except that here's the problem with that. And I might mention this a little bit later too uh, in uh, this afternoon. But here's the problem with that. You can know every promise in the book and quote it until a paint peels off the walls and it virtually does nothing because you're not doing it in relationship with Jesus. You're just quoting scripture verses and you're quoting them actually in a superstitious manner. What, you, what we need to do is take those scripture verses and meditate on them long enough that they become really real inside of us. And then we speak out and declare what has become really a revel a revelatory, what has become real to us personally. You know, so uh, I didn't even have to think about the, I mean, we got lots of scriptures for healing and things like that for Bill and, and other people, but uh, we also had prophetic word. That's another thing. Do you know prophecy? And part of what I'm really talking about today is prophetic prayer. And I hate to use that term because we have an incomplete idea of what prayer is and we have an incomplete and sometimes very erroneous idea of what prophecy is and, and what it looks like and what you do with it. 
but I use that term because the gift of prophecy is a tremendous tool in praying as far as the, the whole tr uh, prayer process. So, key thought. Through partnership prayer, you design and dominate the desire of God in natural conditions. Through partnership prayer, and the gift of prophecy really helps us with that, and the spiritual gifts really help with that. But through partnership prayer, you design and dominate the desire of God in natural conditions. Now, yeah, the, the creative partnership with God. Oh, wait, no. Through partnership prayer, you design and dominate the desire of God in or over natural conditions. Over might be a better word. Or within. On top of. Who cares which? Now, I already mentioned the fact of training to yourself to listen to the voice of God rather than the speculation of man. And uh, I want to talk for a moment about how do you do that. How do you train yourself to listen to the voice of God? Meditating on and memorizing Scripture. Not just as a technique to try to remember the words like you do for a test, but pondering the script, meditating, meditating the scripture, and even memorizing it, so that you can bring it back to more uh, to mind and think even more about it, and bring it to your heart. And that's that's the way you meditate on the Word of God day and night. A really good tool to help that become real for you is just to take a few <coughs> key scripture verses that stand out to you that you really want to have in your heart and memorize them. Work at memorizing them. Because then you can keep recalling them and recalling them and recalling them. It's good to write down on 3 by 5 cards and carry them with you. But what's even better is if they're on the 3 by 5 card in your brain. <laughs> I think my card, burning card is about 2 by 1 now. Is it about 2 by 1? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, memorization... One of the things that is really, I suppose, as you get a little older too, uh, is that the memorization, repetition is the best way to memorize and just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. But as you're asking the Holy Spirit to work with you on that memorization and make it real to you, as it be, starts to become revelation, it sticks inside of you. Revelation uh, makes meditation, it makes the word sticky. It just sticks when it becomes real, you know. Then you're not just trying to take words and memorize them. You're, you're getting the fullness of the idea. And the specific words don't matter as much because there's a lot of words that you could use that would uh, really convey the same thing and even better, trying to put it in words putting it on other, in other words. But the issue is meditating on memorizing the scriptures. Learning the sound of his voice and practicing listening to him on a daily basis, talking to him on a daily basis. Um, work at developing a relationship of companionship with him. I don't know if anybody else has tried doing this or not, but the, the chair that I talked to you about a few weeks back in church about Jesus, I, I've got, I actually have something physical. I look, can. Uh, helps my imagination that he's sitting right with me and talk to him like he's... I'm actually going to use that in one of my classes. Yeah, good, good, good. So, so ask the Holy Spirit to bring scripture promises, thoughts, or stories to your mind. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I was about the chair thing, too. I had a kind of a spiritual mother before I met all of you, and what she... She went through a period where she would pour two cups of coffee, one was for Jesus, one was for Yeah, that yeah. Was her she did that for a long time. Oh, yeah. Cool. You know, Den Denise's own testimony is that it's 52 years before, because she was adopted, 52 years before she met her natural mother and her siblings, uh, because the records were locked, and that's a long story in and of itself. However, 
every birthday, and I think other, I'm not sure whether other meals or not, but at least every birthday, every holiday, every holiday any, celebration, family meal. any celebration of a family meal, they always set a place for her. They didn't have any idea where she was, but she was very much in their hearts. Even so when it became a real special miracle, when they were able to, to reconnect. So this thing about creating, do whatever it takes to create companionship with Jesus and making, making him really real rather than a spiritual thought up somewhere distant here. You know, bring him in closer. And you don't have to rely upon your own witty imagination to do that. The Holy Spirit is more than willing to work with you. You have to put in a sense the sweat equity and actually do it, you know, and practice it rather than leaving it just as an idea, which is real Western. I mean, all of our beliefs are conceptual ideas that float around out here, and we think we've really got it down because we have all of these ideas. But maturity, Christian maturity, is the closer friends you are with Jesus, you know, the better and the more you, you really uh, know him from the standpoint of your BFF. Um, so anyway, another way as we are listening, this is the last thing I'm going to say here is, on this class, is you begin to pray. And even out here, as we begin, we'll begin with just some backdrop of music. And, and you ask uh, the Lord to begin to speak to you. And what he'll do, and ask him to do it this way, that makes it easier rather than listening to an empty void to see if a sound will come into it. Because a lot of times people say, I don't hear God. I mean, I don't hear God. I know I'm supposed to hear God. If I'm saved, I, I'm supposed to hear God. It makes me wonder if I'm saved or not because I don't hear him and blah, blah, blah. Well, we're listening for an empty void. Ask him to do something specifically. Ask, make a specific request of him rather than just a generalized statement of, would you speak to me, please? So ask him to bring scripture promises Thoughts or stories to your mind. Because he really uses recall a lot. He'll remind you of scripture verses. He'll remind you of scripture stories. He'll remind you of events. He'll bring all of those, those kinds of things to mind. And an example of this is that, and let's just pretend that you were uh, the one that received this. Because this morning, as I was thinking about the class and about today. And I asked the Lord to bring a thought to me and he brought a song. That's another thing, bring a song to me. And uh, I'm, I don't know if you've heard this one. This is a long old song. But the words of it are, I'm my beloved's and me, he is mine. His banner over me is love. Okay. Now, if, as, if that comes to mind for you and you are asking the Lord to speak to you, for, for, for the purpose of praying for somebody or some group, how would you respond to that? How, you, how would you, what's the imagery that would come to you about how you would pray? Thank you, Lord, for your banner of love over your people or over these certain people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. And what that banner represents and the belonging to him and covering and protection from him. Uh -huh. yeah. I would also thank him for letting me know that I heard that. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. I was listening with my spiritual ears. Mm -hmm. And I heard it. Because I could have heard it and not been yeah. listening to it. Yes. I would just yeah. thank him that I could hear him. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's really a lot of... Uh, th and this develops over time. You get used to starting to do this. Banner... It is actually the meaning of a banner is a, it's a statement of victory and his love is our victory and you can pray that that individual or that group would know the banner of victory that's over them that his love that those that don't recognize the power of his love in their life that they'd have a fresh revelation of the victory that they have in life because his love is for them and they'll feel that banner flying over them and wrapping around them. You know, you see, you can just do that. Now, anybody can do that in their own words. Uh, and you get, I mean, you're a writer. So you've got a creative imagination from that standpoint. But you really don't have to be. 
uh, I mean, you could just simply get up and pray the simple prayer. Lord, I'm praying today for that banner of love that you showed me that you want for this place. That's it. A lot of times people won't pray, especially in a group, because they feel like, um, I'll, I'll just be a stuttering mess and I won't pray a good prayer and blah, 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 in, until you start. You know, how does a baby learn to walk? By tripping and falling. That's actually how a baby learns to walk, by tripping and falling. Yeah, but they're so cute. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, then, and, the, and, and the cool thing is, is that God thinks that, it's, that it affects him. He might not say, oh, you're so cute, Lorraine. <laughs> But but his heart, he but his but his yeah. but his heart warms yeah. to you, because of uh, you are trying, you know, and and you don't let your pride get in the way that I'll look stupid because that's really pride, you know, and that kind of thing. So, all right, well that's that is the first class, and let's finish by repeating the key thought: prayer is creative partnership with God and His sons and daughters. And through partnership prayer, you design and dominate the desire of God over natural conditions.